Mike Sullivan. I'm a former IRS agent and teaching instructor. Um, I welcome to my YouTube channel. Uh, I my YouTubes are short. They're sweet. They're to the point. About three minutes long. Uh, me and my M and M man give you a thumbs up for listening today. Uh, I've worked thousands of cases uh, since I've been in practice, both with the IRS and out. And I want to talk to you today about how you get an IRS wage garnishment released. As a former a IRS agent, I signed my name to thousands, thousands of them. You know, you don't want to do that, but you have to. IRS has sent you a series of notices, CP2000, a CP501, 503, 504, 1058, a whole series of notices, and usually the taxpayer has not gotten back to IRS. So systemically, not a person even is looking at your case. The computer just puts them in envelopes, and they send them out by thousands really every day. And like I said, they don't want to do that. Now, many times you did not even get your mail. You show up to work one day and the employer says, hey, I got a 668W here. We're taking your check. Here's a few exemptions that you can get, but we're taking the bulk of it. So how do you get that levy released? Well, you simply call the name, uh, that phone number that's on that levy uh, of whoever issued it. It's usually a 1-800 number or a local agent. Um, do you do this by yourself or, or don't you do it by yourself? Mm. You know, some people can do this by themselves, but you have to understand how IRS works. IRS is going to want a 433A fi a F financial statement if it's in the service center, a 433A. If it's in the local office, like uh, like I was with a revenue officer, and they're going to want it documented. They're going to have to literally close your case off the IRS collection enforcement computer. They'll put a code that freezes everything. They will close your case and put you either into a hardship, a payment agreement, or they may recommend the an offer and compromise somewhere down the road. But in the meantime, you're going to have to be prepared to give IRS a financial statement and document it. They're going to want things like your last six months bank statements. You want to know what your assets, what your liquidity is, what your uh, monthly uh, paycheck is, and what your expenses the really big news for everybody, and they don't understand, IRS has national standards and local and regional standards, and you're only allowed to live on so much money a month. So maybe in an area you're allowed to make three or 4000 and if you're making $6,000, IRS wants $2,000 a month. So if you're making very little money and you have a lot of confidence that you don't have a lot, you can call them, call yourselves that number and send that information but if you have any trepidation, don't call IRS because IRS is going to stick to those strict national standards of expenses and you could went, end up with a large payment agreement. So it's on a case by case basis whether you should call. But two things you have to, two things, you have, sorry about the, the, the stream, two things you have to know. You have to make all, make sure all tax returns are filed and you have enough withholding so IRS doesn't see this is a repeated problem. By the way, on the 668W on your wage garnishment, the employer will take and they'll, they'll give you around 20% of your money back. It's a continuous levy, and that money is going to go to IRS until, until, until IRS goes ahead and sends a release to your employer. If you're going to pick up the phone and uh, call IRS, uh, you should have the fax number of your HR department so they can fax the release. So you got to be careful. If it's a small case, you don't have any assets, call. If it's not bigger, you probably want to call someone like me or a tax professional. Always answer, open for questions, and uh, you have my contact information. Thank you.